And here are your hosts, RJ Young and Brandon Drum. What's up, kid folk? I am back with Brandon Drum for an emergency upload of Young and Drum, where we're going to talk about the new defense coordinator at Oklahoma. That would be the one, the mean one, Alex Grinch. Brandon, how you doing, man? <laughs> Yeah, that I'm pretty good, but uh, it's been quite a whirlwind past couple of days. Uh, the mean one, uh, he's nothing more than sauerkraut in a sock or whatever they say in the in the song. The Grinch is the Grinch is in town, and uh, he's here to steal the ball away from offenses. All the Grinch puns, all of them. Give me all your Grinch yes, puns. Yes, and yes, and that's kind of the is, thing he... that I found was great <laughs> about figuring out this guy's defensive philosophy is it feels like he could be thrown in here right away and do some good because he's used to seeing a 3-4 alignment, even if it's not a true 3-4 defense with a two-gap scheme because he's a one-gap guy. And he also emphasizes takeaways, for which Oklahoma, to put it mildly, has sucked. We had 11 takeaways for this defense in 2018, and the two teams playing for the national title this weekend had 22 and 21. So that's the gap that Grinch is brought here to close. And I thought it was really cool that one of the things that I found was Check it out. He did a private study about takeaways to see what kind of influence turnovers have on a defense. And he said, if you got 24 turnovers, you can get nine wins for your team. And his first season at Washington State, they got exactly 24 takeaways and they got exactly nine wins. So strip, forced fumbles, interceptions. It seems like that's what this dude wants and effort, of course. Yeah, he he definitely is... Seems like a guy that really does like to turn around defenses. He did so at uh, Washington State. Now, mind you, that was his alone kind of being the D.C. Uh, kind of job that he had. But I will say that people would want to really, really pinpoint, oh, well, you know, Ohio State's defense wasn't that great this year ever since he showed up. Guys, he didn't even call the defenses. So... Uh, the yeah, let, let's, why let's emphasize that just for a yeah. moment because folks keep talking about how bad Ohio State was on defense this year, particularly that they regressed in, in the 2018 season following a, a pretty good 2017 season, especially in pass defense. But number one, he didn't call the defense. Number two, he coached the safeties, not the secondary, the safeties. And for those of you that are keeping score, the number one recruit in the state of Oklahoma committed to Ohio State and was a safety guy named Josh yep. Proctor. So, And that's also some of the scuttlebutt is – could Josh Proctor up and leave Ohio State to come to Oklahoma? I haven't heard that that's even on the table. But No, and I talked to his dad yesterday. That doesn't sound like that's going to be on the cards at all. Right. But we'll see. Right. But uh, I also just wanted to emphasize how little he did have to do with the working controls of the defense. And when he's been able to call it, granted it was one time, they were pretty good. Yep. No, he, he, he he's, he's a very, very good guy. I mean – I'm sorry, but people need to realize this guy is very, very well thought of around the coaching ranks. By the way, since I'm, we've been on this podcast, uh, OU football finally got around to officially announcing that Alex Grinch is the new defense coordinator at Oklahoma. So if you probably saw that press release about the same time that we started recording this podcast. Very nice. So, Good for them. I have yet to get it in my, uh, my inbox there, which is pretty 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 annoying well i mean that's uh, that, that just makes sense that that just makes sense but yeah the whole the whole uh i'm actually shocked i really thought they were going to do it tomorrow but um i'm glad they did it they needed to have it done before the before the uh, fca convention which yeah, starts on sunday which which i will be at when, which is hey be that so a boy we talked about it yeah yeah i got i got the go ahead from boss man to stay another couple of nights and have it the old company pay for it. So I'm going to do it That's and I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so let's talk about some questions that I know Oklahoma fans have starting with how good is Grinch as a recruiter? Now I know that he was running lead on Jordan battle who ended up in mm -hmm. Alabama, but it might've been that this job was up. So, you know, Jordan battle didn't want to commit to a guy that wasn't going to be there. But yeah. also that's the highest regarded recruit that I could find for this guy that he was really leaning toward and when you look at Washington State they don't really recruit defensively like that or at all like that so it's really hard to gauge how good he is so what's your read on Alex Grinch as a recruiter 
So uh, anybody that thinks the guy can't recruit, I think is just crazy because one, he was at Washington state. So that's really an awful gauge on just about anybody getting any kid to Pullman, Washington is a chore. And I don't even know how to describe it. I would say it's uh, a lot like Kansas state and West Virginia, actually more like West Virginia than, than Kansas state in that. Well, I mean, I think it would be easier to get to West Virginia because West Virginia literally is five minutes across the board, five miles across the border of Pennsylvania and like 45 minutes from Pittsburgh. So there's well, actual life you're also, at West Virginia. You're also dealing with Pittsburgh and Penn State as well as Marshall. And that's why I was staying in Washington State because you got Washington down the road. Yeah, you but got they Oregon have such a, over there with you too. You know, it just – it feels like it was a one-to-one. -one. Maryland though. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, it just feels like it was a one-to-one -one when you talk about regional yeah. powers that you got to recruit around as well. Oh hey, I got the I got the email. Hey, <laughs> hey there we go. Anyways, um, no, it, it's just that I, it's it's not easy. It's not, it is not easy to recruit to Pullman, Washington, and then he goes off to Oklahoma or Ohio State, and he's he's getting guys. I mean, he helped close out Josh Proctor. He did a lot of other things while he's there, and basically had Jordan Battle all but lined up uh, up until just the past month. And that Jordan Battle leaving had a lot to do with the uncertainties out at Ohio State. So it, it looks like Battle made a good move. But here's the ironic part about it. If Battle would have just waited another couple of weeks and signed during the late signing period, I'm going to bet Oklahoma probably would have landed Jordan That's, Battle. That was where I was heading to because I'd asked yeah. about that as well. Uh, but I also had reason to believe that this hire had been weeks in the making because just checking around and talking to some folks – there were some folks uh, that were picking up on Oklahoma late in part yeah. because they knew that the defensive coordinator was going to be there. And I don't think we need to talk about who that is, but uh, we all know who that is, Mr. Right. West Coast, Mr. West Coast. Well, hey, look, there, there's one of those, right? But yep. I also think that this is Lincoln Riley and, and lining his ducks up as he needs them to fall, especially yes. with his extension and then – his kids announcing that they're going to go into the NFL draft, and then you announce your coordinator, and then possibly pick up the, I mean, I guess you could go 1B for the best wide receiver in the country in Jaden Hazelwood, possibly. I mean, that would be a crown mm -hmm. to your week, man. This is, this would, it's already yeah, a big it's... week for Lincoln Riley. It could be enormous by Saturday evening. That guy, I, I mean, Oklahoma has just hit a home run. I, I well, I would think it would be a grand slam. I mean, they they hit for the cycle, basically something that's really rare in baseball, and what they've done. I've it. never Whatever heard of the it cycle. Is, they've done I, it. I only know uh, bicycles. What is the cycle? Oh, I'm joking. I'm the cycle joking. when you hit. I'm joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm a baseball like, well, nerd. No, I was just okay. Yeah, no. So basically, yeah, he's Oklahoma's done whatever. What have you? Whatever analogy, whatever you want to put to it. They've done it with, with Lincoln Riley, I think. Two years, two playoffs, two Heismans. Uh, the guy has nailed every hire that he's made so far, and uh, he continues to recruit at a level only seen in Clemson, South Carolina, and Birmingham, Alabama, and Columbus, Ohio. So there is something to be said for what that guy is doing right now at the University of Oklahoma, and it's only going to get better. If people really believe that, it isn't in that there's going to be other issues because, oh, Kyler Murray's leaving. Guys, I think he's recruited well enough that there's always going to be a good quarterback at Oklahoma. And if there's not, somebody's going to come in and want to fill that position from somewhere around the country. <clears throat> Jalen Hurts. And um, maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe want to well, – uh, let, let, let's, let's back up a little bit. This is as good a day as it appears to be for Oklahoma and how it could get better – Georgia had Justin Fields, Isaac Nada, Riley Riddle, Ridley, excuse me, Miko Hardman, Elijah Holyfield, and Luke Ford all decide, you know, we're done at Georgia. To which yeah. I was going, the wheels are coming. Now, you got five five stars coming in, and I think that's got as much to do with it as anything else. But the wheels are coming off that thing after they lost the Sugar Bowl to Texas. Like, I didn't expect it to be this bad. Like, like Luke Ford, we we talked about it on the podcast. We yeah. kind of thought that that was the uh, the issue. I had said Illinois. You were saying that Oklahoma was still in play. It seems like kid just wanted to go. Yeah, home. he's going to Illinois. Right, he's a good, good call right there. Right, but but also guys like Ridley and and Holyfield and um, Hardman. I mean, I guess I guess we were we were 
I was leaning toward Isaac Nada being gone just because his potential is so good. But the rest of these guys, like, come on, man. Like, what is – is it that Kirby lied to them? Is it that they want to quit on the team, like people say, which I think is a bogus argument. But it can't be ignored that they all left at once. Nope. And I think that there is some issues going on down there. And once you once you saw Justin Fields leave, you could kind of tell that there's there's major issues because why would a five star guy leave other than there is possible favoritisms that players don't like? Like, like we discussed off off there one day one day that uh, I mean Jake Fromm, his dad was supposedly or according to everybody that I've talked to was like college roommates with Kirby Smart at Georgia. So this. This whole deal just screams issues behind the scenes. And maybe Kirby's got a lot to learn being a head coach, and this is part of that growing process for him because uh, maybe he's used to doing things a different way. Well, as a head coach, you can't do it like you can a coordinator. And I think sometimes that catches up with you two, three years down the road. You've got the program rolling, and all of a sudden, you know, the rug gets pulled out from underneath you because people start catching up to what you're doing to them. And that may be what's going on here. You know, we can't confirm that. We don't really know. But that's sure from afar what it definitely looks like is going on, that there probably was some promises not kept and other things that were said behind the scenes that that people obviously don't like and they don't want to be around it anymore. So they're going to take their talent somewhere else to the NFL. Which is why I also continue to commend Lincoln Riley for the way that he's been able to keep the staff together even over two years. Even yeah. through a coordinator change, and you basically had to put some duct tape on this defense, such as it was, and try to get up for a run after losing to Texas. And he did that, despite what anybody wants to say about the defense. And, you know, I got into yeah. it on the radio here recently because uh, I'm a I mean, I'm he a fired his best, one of his best friends. Right. He fired one of his best friends of Mike Stoops. Like, and they were so close. I'm a player advocate in that I believe that, that kids – need to be helped in the positivity in that they know that they suck when they suck. They don't need you to tell them repeatedly that they suck. And telling a kid like Kenneth Murray Jr. that he's not a great linebacker after you put together 155 tackles in a season, which is, I think it's the most since Curtis Lofton or the most, it might be the most since or the most, it's not the most ever because that's Jackie Ship with like 189, which is stupid. But the fact of the matter is, they were being told that they were running away from tackles and that they didn't want any part of Alabama's offense. And really, the scheme didn't help them and they didn't help themselves. But to say yeah. that a dude that had 15 tackles in the on the day didn't come up to play is ludicrous. But I, I bring all that yeah. to say, what do we know about the defensive position coaches' changes, if there might be any at all going forward? Uh, there's going to be something. I mean, I'm, I keep hearing Kish is going to retire, but I want everybody to know that I've heard Kish is going to retire for three straight years, and it's never happened. So it's like um, saying Merv's going to retire. I mean, yeah, yes, no, that, but no. That, that, that was the exact analogy I was given by somebody on the inside. Was you know we heard the same thing about Merv, and it took forever for that to actually happen. And even then, he's like, still here, right? He's still yeah, here. he's still that. Yeah, well, yeah, he retired as a coach, but yeah, I mean that. And the same thing goes for Kish. Now I can see Kish actually retiring and like sticking around as like a like some sort of ambassador or whatever, kind of like Bob has done, but, or he may just ride off on the sunset back to Arizona. You never know. But, uh, that, I mean, well, I've also heard that as well, but I, you know, talking to people close to that, there, a decision has not been made yet. I can say that it hasn't been officially made, but I think we'll know more next Wednesday when the staff rides back and Riley meets with everybody exactly where everybody stands. I think that, some people feel that uh, Cooks and Kish may be the ones that could get ousted. But at the same time, I want everybody to know that Grinch has been a safeties coach almost his whole career and just a DB's coach maybe a handful of times, a handful of years throughout his career. He's 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 been a safeties coach. Well, Not I mean, I get, safeties, I get all of so that. I get all of that myself. You could, do, right? you because, could split it is I, what I'm saying. You could in the way that he might want to coach the defense, but also as a coordinator, do you really want to be the safeties coach or the corners coach or the secondary coach? And I guess, you know, that's his prerogative. And that'll, yeah, even, that's but, but when he was, but, I will but, say, yeah, well, you're right. Even you're if, right because even if he wanted to coach the safeties, I don't necessarily know that 
folks are going to be enthused. I mean, and what, what folks think, and when I say folks, I mean fans, are going to be enthused yeah. with the return of Kerry Cooks, no, d- despite no, no, despite yeah. what he might have done or might be able to do if he was just choking corners. Because, you know, that was part of the thing with, with Mike was they were saying, hey, man, maybe he's just bit off too much, and, and we need to just hand that off to somebody else. And then they brought in Cooks. And not a whole lot changed. And you can make an argument that that's talent, but you got to recruit talent, so forth, so on. So maybe you just want a fresh set of hands and a fresh set of eyes out there to help you out if you're Grinch. Maybe you do want to bring in at least one guy that is your own that you can count on to do it the way you want it done. Yeah, no, I agree there. But uh, yeah, if you're going to do that, maybe you bring in somebody you, you, you feel comfortable about. But maybe, and just maybe, that uh, Lincoln Riley says, look, man, this guy killed it at Notre Dame when he was in a different scheme, a more aggressive scheme. Why not give him a chance to see? And if you don't like it, let's move him on. And, and I say that as a person that, that really feels that okay, – and I and I wrote this. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a piece on the board, and I, I don't like giving quibits of, of everything that I put up the board, but I will give a little bit right here. And that is, look, a source flat out told me Cooks hated the scheme that they ran – under Mike, as far as the secondary goes, he hated the corners. He hated, like, when I say quarter corners, he hated the corner cover, the quarter coverage, not corners, quarter coverage. He hated it, absolutely despised it. I was yeah, told, but what, what, and that's what, one thing that he wanted to get back to was getting up in people's faces and and being physical and pressing at the line and doing everything that he felt needed to be done. But Mike's scheme didn't allow for that because of all the stuff that it would give up if they were. Uh, to go aggressive, and we saw that kind of. You don't really have Alabama. a choice, though. That's kind of the thing, though, man. I mean, like, I I get that that's the line, and I get that that you. It's don't... not really the line. It's kind of the truth. No, 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 no. Matter. I don't mean yeah. like the line, as in he's giving you a line. I mean the line in the sand, as the in the one that you got to cross over, because we've watched physical defensive backs and physical cornerbacks basically bully other folks and pick up the penalties, by the way, and still put together mm-hmm. and and do the things that you need to do as a defense, which is prevent teams from getting the big play right and prevent them from scoring with touch with passing touchdowns and if you can do yeah, that but if the dc says you have to coach it this way you have to do it right as the, right 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 yeah, and, I, and I get, so what i'm saying is i think that's always been the line for which they that he has to cross that that the, that the yeah. defensive staff has to cross right about how you are going to coach your defensive backs because i think that's also the place where you can make an immediate impact next year even if, if it's grant or it's cooks or whoever is just changing the technique that the corners play. Because mm-hmm. you're going you're playing the bail technique, which I hate, which you hate, which everybody yeah, hated except apparently, apparently Mike so Stoops. Does Cooks, from right. what I'm told. Appar- so. Everybody but but Mike Stoops hated, right? And I yep. get you gotta coach what they tell you to coach, but you don't you don't really have a choice anymore. You have to play bump and run because Yeah, and that's that's this what is Grinch untenable. Does. Right? Yeah. The, the situation yeah. as it is is untenable. Yeah, no, so, and that's what Grinch does, and I think that's that's kind of where if you were going to keep it, you could keep him as a corners coach and allow and just say, dude, you're going to coach physical. You're going to get up and you're going to press. And I think Cooks would enjoy that and like it because that's what he's coached his whole career except for under Mike Stoops. No, he was good seems. at Notre Dame. That was the thing. He's good at Notre Dame. Yeah, because they were physical. That's what they coached was he coached physical corners. Right. And I, I guess that was that was my whole thing is why did you hire a guy to do something different than what he knows how to do, which was one of the reasons recruit. why – the 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 Diaco hire kind of made a little bit of sense because, hey man, at least he's gonna play man, and at least he knows the staff, and at least we have the personnel to kind of sort of run what he knows how to call. But nobody here uh, that supports the team was gonna be happy with that. No, you know, and I and I think that Lincoln made the right decision in going outside and going to get a dude that he knew would go over well as just opposed to the things that he wants to run. Like we uh, we talked about this a lot in that. A lot of folks are trying to call this Texas Tech North in that it's Mike Leach's offensive uh, staff and defensive staff to a degree that ends up at Oklahoma, to which I continue to tell people, hey, Oklahoma gave Texas Tech an identity with Mike Leach. Yep. One. Yeah, and, nah. and two, Mike Leach's disciples have been very good to Oklahoma. One of them's the head coach, right? One of them yep. is uh, Bill Beedbo, the offensive line coach. Mm-hmm. So even if you want to make the Texas Tech North first, argument. First coach, Simmons. Right. Well, I mean, even if you want to make that argument, it's working. It's working better here than yeah. it's working at Washington State, man. And to a degree, well, I mean, it, it, North Texas. I mean, freaking uh, uh, Latrell's uh, Mike Stoops' disciple as well. I mean, my goodness, 
literally the whole Arizona staff at, um, outside of Kish w- with Mike that turned that program around before Mike got ousted, which was just a dumb move by Arizona. When you look back at it, like he was a good good head coach, which is just so crazy now when you look back at it. Like they haven't ever been the same. Well, they won eight. They won eight games and they fired him. Well, and that I guess the, you know you just saw Major Applewhite get fired for winning eight games. All right, yeah. I think I think a lot of it has to do with not just. Not just the number of wins you had, but I, I dug into this into this Houston thing with Major Applewhite, Dana Hogerson, because, mm-hmm. I mean, I've been critical of the move, and I remain critical of the move, but when Tillman Fertitta says to you, what does it take you know, to get you to Houston if you're unhappy at West Virginia, and then they put up or shut up with money that is ridiculous, you can see that they were really into wanting to win, and that was the reason they made the move. Is just yeah. we, made, we gave Major Applewhite the job to try to put together some sort of continuity. And I think that Mike never had an opportunity to build that, but he wanted mm. to build it. And he put, I mean, making Josh Heifel your tight ends coach, you could do about a lot worse than that from an X's and O's standpoint, no matter what you believe about his attitude and about just kind of monotone hey, that he is. Hey, not to, not to interrupt you, but l- l- let me tell you wh- who was on that staff at Arizona real quick. Tim Kish, Bill Biedenboe, Dana Holgerson. Like, this was on the Arizona staff. Seth Luttrell. Brian Odom. Brian or Barry? Brian okay. Odom. All right. Grinch. Yeah. No, like, I, that's, are you that's kidding where me? I was like what? That, that, no, the that's heck, that's where man. I was where I was headed. Where I headed. But but also Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go no, ahead. No, but but Sorry. but that, I mean, I also don't necessarily know that Mike Stoos was the guy to lead him. That's where I was right. going, right? Cuz you knew the assortment of talent and when you got that assortment of coaching talent around you, I think a lot of what you have to do is what Barry Switzer did at the Dallas Cowboys, is, which is just take your hands off of everything and let everybody do their job. You know, and I don't know that Mike yeah. is that guy, man. I don't. Matter of fact, I know that Mike is not that guy. You know, and <laughs> yeah. I think that's that's, that's fair. The issue. That's fair. That's you, fair. You yeah. needed a bunch of folks around you that you could tell what's what. I mean, this is this is a this is a this is going to raise some eyebrows with the comp, but and it's not this severe, but I'm still going to use it. Mike yeah. Stoops. And the dude at India Independence Community College, where they wanted it their way, and you got to do it my way, <laughs> and I have my and I have my attitude, and my attitude is the attitude. Hey man, uh, I I don't see a lot of dis- and that's not to say that it's just him. It's also just coaches in general. It's not a lot of guys mm-hmm. that are like Lincoln Riley who are going to be like, you know what? I can work with Baker Mayfield. I can work with this dude. And and not only that, I think everything that he brings to the table is an asset. It does not prevent me from being a good coach. And his right. ability to relate to people and allow them to do what they do best, as opposed to, no, we're gonna do it my way. I don't, I don't really care that your way might be better. I know what works for me. To which, if you know anything about Dana Holgerson, just to take a look at that staff, you know that that dude doesn't want to be told much of anything. Matter of fact, he didn't even buy a house when he lived in Stillwater. That's how eager he was to just use this as a stepping stone because he wasn't gonna work for Mike Gundy, not for any any length of no. time. And, and Mike knew that. That's why he went to go get the dude from Shipping Bird State. So I'm saying it ain't just my man Jason up there at Independence Community College, and it ain't just Mike. It, it's coaches. You either got Lincoln Riley or you got Mike Gundy. You usually don't have anything in between. Yeah, I know. And it, 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 <laughs> the funny thing is, is your sister didn't last very long either. He, he's, yeah, he's heading off to Ohio State, which is just so weird. Like, I don't understand that hire by Ryan Day at all. But I, I, I understand it in that – you want to make a bend toward uh, an offense that is more predicated on throwing the ball as a quarterback rather than running Urban Meyer's you know, spread to run because that's what Ryan Day does best. He's a quarterback's coach, and, and he's been a quarterback's coach everywhere he's gone. And bringing in somebody else who can help you install a different sort of system where you're not so much dependent on the legs of the quarterback to do anything makes sense to me just knowing his background. That's how that— that's how that fell to me. Like I wouldn't, I wasn't caught off guard by that because I know that your shit you spent the last few years running an air raid, right? And when you yep. watched what Ohio State yep. was doing last year with Haskins, they were basically trying to do the same thing with the limited play. Yeah, that they with had. Urban. Yeah, with Urban's crappy spread to run. Two, yeah, spread to run. Two thousand seven. Right. Tim Tebow offense, which yeah. works with JT Barrett, works with Tim Tebow, even works with Cardell Jones. Works a little bit at Texas, right? Because they probably basically work do with that Tate with... Martell, actually. Right, and that's kind of the issue. So, <clears throat> I'm really interested to see what happens with Yursic and Tate Martell because I don't think that Justin Fields is going to get cleared to play this year. And and, no, and whether or not they throw right. the ball, you know, 65 percent of the time or run it 
with him more often than they throw it. It's really you're interesting. Probably, probably right. Yeah, you're probably right. I don't, I don't see how they can actually – I don't know how you could actually clear that guy just because of somebody said something to you. It, whether it, I mean, it was despicable what the person said. I mean, allegedly. I mean, whatever, because we don't really have proof of it. But well, We don't have proof of it. But, I mean, it, it's just one of those things that – that would be a tricky thing for the NCAA to, uh, I guess, okay, because then people would be doing that all the time. Anytime they're unhappy at a situation, whether it's true or not, just start I, I know allegedly ruining up. people. I know you brought that up, and I and I I didn't challenge it then, and I'm not really challenging it now. I am saying <clears throat> that using if somebody uses a racial slur or a oh, religious yeah, slur yeah. against you, I don't think that. One, you should have to stand for it. I think it's going to make you uncomfortable anywhere you are. Mm-hmm. Speaking as a as yep. speaking as a black man to a white man who is you, right? Um, yeah. Uh, about yeah. about this, it's this would affect me if I was at Georgia, if I was at OU, mm-hmm. wherever I work. This would affect me, and it does affect me. I've made YouTube yeah. videos about how this affects me. So if the NCAA wanted to to allow him to play immediately, based on some sort of proof that he was called this or whatever. I think no, that's yeah, a good if he has proof, I'm behind it 100%. Yes, well, uh, if he has 100% proof, yes, I'm so behind it. Well, and I you guess have that's, no idea. that's that's yeah, the that's, thing. Yeah, that's is, what I'm saying. Is uh for me, it's just hey, as the NCAA is taking a stand with this too, which is to say, hey Georgia, get your house in order or we're going to allow this, right? And maybe you'll get, you'll get a rash of them, maybe. Yeah. Uh but also, hey man, he knows the score, and I think uh, the, going back to Justin Fields and the quarterback situation and Mike Yersic, I think Yersic was a higher made to the future in Justin Fields because if you know anything about Justin Fields, and we do, but informing mm-hmm. folks, Quincy Avery is his quarterback's coach, who was Dwayne Haskins' quarterback coach. One, <laughs> and two, yeah. that dude wants to be an NFL quarterback, and he was being treated like a glorified Wildcat quarterback at Georgia and at Ohio State. If you're going to make a commitment to this dude, to groom him for the NFL, you're going to have to make him into a better passer. He passed 4,000. He rushed for 2,000. We know he can do it with his legs, but nobody wants to be just, I say this, just Cam Newton is an MVP. But he also takes a lot of hits. They depend on him to do a lot of work with the legs. And you would much rather that you go into the NFL, at, at least as a draft pick, as Dwayne Haskins than Cam Newton. That said, Cam mm-hmm. Newton's number one overall pick, and I think most people would take that dude in a heartbeat. Point is, if you want to develop this dude into a passer— I think that you bring in a guy like Myersich to help him. No, no, you do. And here's the other thing is when you look at the SEC, like, and you get guys like a Justin Fields or Kyler Murray or anybody to that ilk, they never stay. I mean, outside of Cam Newton for one year, nobody, and I mean nobody that has any sort of athletic ability at the quarterback position, I mean Tua, and then you got look, look at Jalen Hurts. Hurts. Hurts has stayed though. I know, I know what you. Yeah, reported. but I mean, I know what you stayed, have, but, but, he's, but he stayed. Yeah, he stayed, but they can't. They don't know really what they're doing with him. Like they just kind of. Th- I mean, they're throwing him out of wide receiver, and, and that's they're why, doing all kinds of stuff. Right, and, and it and, doesn't and, make sense. And they just don't in that league. They just don't have enough creative minds to do that. Where. The Big 12 and the Big 10, you know, the Big 10 used to be that league that was just inside a little box, and they're going to run halfback ISOs and, and, I would and student body right. I would watch yeah. grass grow than 2010, 2000 era's Big 10 football. It's just yeah. the worst. Yeah, So and, and now when they're starting to open things up a little bit in that, that, that league. So, I mean, the SEC, yeah, they're winning some titles. Well, Alabama's winning titles, but – Outside of that, they've got they have got to get more. Not if they play dive. defense, and they do. That's 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 the reason they haven't had to evolve really past Gus Malzahn. Is they don't have yeah. to. Like if you looked at what Georgia did to get to the Sugar Bowl and even get to the SEC championship, they didn't make Jake Fromm throw it all over the yard, and they certainly didn't do anything with those running backs that you wouldn't but, expect an NFL running back to do. They they had tools to do it though they just didn't because they can play defense. But even Sabins had to had to get diverse though. Like, I don't look at the so, offense that so I don't think that he had to. I think no, but I think he to. felt like he needed to. Because, yeah, because Johnny Football torched him. And yeah, he and decided so did, never so did again. Knight, and but but and so did so did uh Watson. So I mean, it, it, but Clemson. I mean, here's so the deal: he the second him. Oklahoma gets a the second Oklahoma gets a defense outside of Alabama, Clemson, and Oklahoma. If you don't have an offense that is any 
bit diverse, you're not going to beat those three. I, like, that's, that's just how it is I, because I, they've been recruiting so I, well. I hear this, and, and yet I know that I can get a top quarterback in any class because there are top quarterbacks in every class. What I know I can't do overnight is but what Alex scheme. Grinch is being hired to do, which is build a championship defense. Like this, this year more than any other proved to me that you can't win a championship without a defense. And, and we talk about the You're offensive right. evolution. We talk about how the rules have been relaxed in to, to make it easier to play offensive football and to score points, which is better for not just buckets in the seats, but butts in the seats, excuse me, but also, you know, just your, your overall appeal. But the thing that's going to win you football games is defense. And, and I just... I get what you're so saying, and I understand that if Oklahoma does get to that level, you're right. But the road to get to that level is so much more difficult than recruiting a high-caliber quarterback. If well, for he, no other he, reason, then you can get a guy like Justin Fields to transfer to you. He turned Washington State from a top 100 defense into a top 30 defense in like for a three year. straight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's so. It's but I'm, but my point, my point is, is that he's got more talent to deal with. Now that now I will say this. I will say this. I don't expect him, and I never would expect him to have a top thirty defense in the Big Twelve, just because of the offenses. And we've we've seen it, like we Gary see Patterson it, and we see. It. Right, but I mean, Gary I'm Patterson talking about. Did it with I'm talking the consistently same sort of every talent year. that Washington State has right now, like that. Yeah, but every year, every year, I'm saying every year. Okay. Every year. All right. All right. Every year, TCU doesn't do that every year, but they they're good. They don't you know, have that's, the talent. That's where I was. That's that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going with this. Okay. Is that if 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 they can get a top 50 like in the big 12 if you have a top 50 defense the chances are outside the big 12 you're probably top 30 defense right right i mean that that's right right okay right. i mean so it's if you to play. get to be a top 50 defense you're going to be one of the best defenses in the country if you're in the big 12 in a top 50 defense that is that's just how it is and we've seen that in the bowl games where the big 12 who has like these top 60 70 defenses and they go out and they light up everybody else and they stop everybody else except for Oklahoma obviously everybody else was doing good on defense outside of Oklahoma and that, that's my point is that it can be done you have a top 50 defense at the University of Oklahoma you're going to win some national titles you, you would have won you would be going back to back right now uh, and and I mean there's 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 stats on the ground that say that you're correct um, and, and I just I want to pivot just a little bit you know, back to, to Grinch in this defense and how it how he can affect it right away. What, if anything, could he affect change with in the recruiting going toward National Signing Day? Is there a guy out there that he could say, this is the kind of guy that I like and this is the kind of, basically whistling to everybody else, this is what kind of defense that we're going to be. But the, the 2019 class is basically all signed up for the most part. You, know, you got to look Juco. Juco. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't... mean well, that would be us going and scouring the JUCO ranks, but I mean it literally just happened, and I was at the combine, so I have yet to actually sit down and start scouring the JUCOs to see who is still available at the JUCO ranks because I think that is, if you're an Oklahoma fan, that is where you want to pinpoint your eyes is who is available in the JUCO ranks, who is available on the West Coast where he's been at for majority of his career, and who is available in Ohio and in Florida because that's where he's recruited most. Those are those are his stomping grounds. Now, I will say that the, the the coaches in Dallas, the second he was hired, and the people that I've talked to, obviously with me being down at the combine, there's so many coaches and seven on seven and trainers and everybody's all around that you have to rub shoulders with and talk with, and they're all amazing people, um, and and they they treat those kids so well, um, but they all love the hire. They all said, "Dude, this is a huge home run, home run for Oklahoma." The second they got him. They were like, these guys are going to win national title in the next three years. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, and, that's and, bold. That's hey, bold. Hey, the same talk was said about Lincoln Riley because of the way the offense had begun to tank with Jay Norvell and Josh Heupel as the offensive coordinators. Though and he fixed Heupel, it. Just the other side of the ball went complete. Right, but we can right. all, all we can guarantee that that side of the offense isn't going to go down. Right, and like, I we think, know that. I think that's also something that that's going to be. I'm going to be eager to watch just with the quarterback. Uh, who, whoever starts against Dana Holger since Houston on August 31st is going to get everybody's attention yeah. because you're immediately going to be picked on because you're not Baker Mayfield or, or Kyler Murray. 
which is unfair. So unfair. But yes. but but also the way I mean that's what you're walking into when you be, want to be the quarterback at the University of Oklahoma. That's just the that's game. why I say a Jalen Hurts would be the best fit right now because he could handle the pressure because he's been in Alabama where there's not much more pressure than you can get than in Tuscaloosa. Their fan base is crazy. It's absolutely crazy, and he was beaten, thrown around, told that he stunk, all kinds of stuff. But all he did was go twenty six and two, so he knows how to handle that pressure. Now the key is, is they've got to be able. To, he's got to put his name in the transfer, transfer portal, and it's got to happen. I mean, Oklahoma has to accept this. I don't know that they do, but there's rumors. There's strong rumors from strong sources that that's a good possibility that that happens. But, again, it has to happen. And I know that's fence riding, but I can sit here and say, yeah, yeah, I'm told it's going to happen. But I don't make those kids' decisions. Well, uh, I don't – you and, know what I mean? Like yeah, that, well, I mean, and, and that's I, kinda, Things change. That's things what, can change well, so that's, fast. I, that's what I want to get into is just we were having deep conversations over the last two days – about nailing down Alex Grinch is the guy because everything that you had heard, everything that I had heard was that, hey, Alex Grinch is the guy, and yet we're unwilling to pull the trigger on it because we just didn't have the source that we wanted to have lined up to be like, yeah, this is it, let's go. And then Bruce Feldman did what I said was going <laughs> to happen, which is yeah. they're gonna, it's going to get broken on Friday morning, and we're going to be talking about it on Friday evening. But just... Yep. Some insight into the process of running down this information, I think, is also interesting to, yeah. to folks as much as we can share, at least. because Yeah, folks, RJ and I were on the phone for hours and hours yesterday, off and on, all day yesterday and the day before. While well, I'm down here covering the Combine. He's he's vetting people. I'm vetting people. I'm calling. He's calling. He's texting. I'm texting. We're trying to figure this out. Now, we were so close. I mean, I'm telling you, we had – I mean, we had it. We were like – we even debated – breaking it last night like we sit there and talk to each other like dude or do you, do you think we should do it mm, do you I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I mean like we thought i mean we knew we had it we knew grinch was the guy we the people that told us it, it was the guy you could trust but it and you you all have got to understand how hard that is to pull that trigger and, and post that because the second you do that, your heart races. You can't sleep. You can't sit still was, because it's got to be announced officially before you're like, oh, okay. Whew. And I was just gonna. I was just thinking about that because we would have been like, we. They sent out the release Sweating during this podcast. Bullets so, for eight hours. So for, no, longer than that, right? Because like we were talking about doing this at like I want to say like nine thirty, ten o'clock. Last oh night. yeah, almost twenty. Yeah, almost so, twenty four so, hours. Yeah, so uh, the, the, your wife would have been joined. You are in, insufferable, and, and my girlfriend would have been like, "You are insufferable," because like, yes, <laughs> I need. I, I and then you know Feldman would have probably come through, and it would have been okay, because even even up until OU says something officially, folks are still like, "Is it done?" It, it, are, yeah, are, no, are you, are you I, sure had, I confirmed it afterwards, but that's the problem is that people I and mean, then somehow it got deleted off our board. I don't know how that happened, but um, it's it's that's the thing. Like the second it happened, I was like, yeah, I can confirm this now because I've had only fifteen different people tell me, hey, Lincoln Riley's hiring Grinch. How do you know? Well, I just know. I'm just like, dude, tell me how you know. They're like, well, because I know people around them, and I'm like. This is just stupid. Like, just tell me how you know. Like, if you would just tell me how you know, I'd just go ahead and break it. But nobody wants to be that guy that is the complete source that ruins it for everybody. And that that's where, you know, I guarantee you Riley's agent or, well, which is also Grinch's agent, leaked it to Feldman because Feldman probably knows the agents. I mean, that's how it works. People got to understand that's how it works. Unless, unless you know that person or somebody like, that close like a family member or something and they actually tell you it's going to come from the agent and that is so hard to get from like it is it the, this this line of business is so hard to close things out and it's so stressful like i mean that's why people have heart attacks so often in our, our line of business it's not it's not an easy line i can tell you that right and i guess that was i mean also your the, the, the people that you're talking to because i we're, we're both talking to recruits we're both talking to uh uh High school coaches. We're both talking to seven and seven coaches. We're talking to other coaches. We're talking to other beat writers. I mean, the the yeah, list inside of, the program. Man, whatever, I, you know, I, we I, were doing I counted yeah. up before Donors. we did this because I wanted to do this part of the podcast. Man, I talked to 114 people this week about this. <laughs> 114. Like that's how much. Like 
Brandon might call me and my phone's on do not disturb, right? Because it just continues to blow up because mm -hmm. with all the stuff that goes on on my phone, if I just left it on, it would do nothing but buzz and ding. Yep. Like I saw Adam Schefter up on the on the on a, on a studio set once and he had two phones out there and they were both buzzing. Like it was I think it was one of it was back when Mike and Mike was still on on TV, like Mike and Mike the radio show. And it was like is that do those things ever just do they do they stop? And he was like, "No." No, they don't. And it's like, so they're just going to sit there and buzz throughout this entire show? Yeah, pretty much they are. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what I thought too. I was like, yes, this dude is locked in. He's plugged in. Also, yeah, no, dude, seriously. Okay. So since you and I have been on here, I've had one, two, three. These are like, you know, I got five. I've had, I got I, five right now. Yeah, I got 12 different text messages <laughs> and two missed calls. So, I mean, yeah, that's that's just it. Like it's it's like, and, and I got a bunch of DMs as well. So, I'm I'm I literally have to put my phone on, phone on vibrate, and I put it face down because yeah. if I don't, I'll sit there and look at it oh, all day. Oh, it is murder to go into a movie theater. Yep. yep. Murder. It's like you know you're going uh, like I'll 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 take Laurel out, and we went to go see Aquaman, and she's like, you gotta turn your phone off, and I'm like, yeah, I know, and I'm gonna, and then you put it away, and then you come out to like literally come out to. 30 text messages, four missed calls, whatever's going on on Twitter, whatever's going yep. on on the board. I mean, this is this is our job and we love it. And this is not a complaint. This is also just to try to give you some insight into how we work, how hard we work. Yeah. And we're not just up here blowing smoke. Like if we say something, it's because we believe it, right? And, and we've, yeah. we've vetted it ourselves. Yep. No, you're 100% correct. It's just, it's kind of amazing how all this kind of plays out. It's, it's, because like it is, we were uh, asking, we both thought it was golding on the last podcast. Remember that? And then like, yeah, like that, like that, it flipped around. And I still don't have a really great answer for why that didn't come into fruition, except that I think saving. I well, do. Well, I, think, I don't know how. I also think that he wanted complete control of the defense, and in that, I mean. Wanted to blow it up and start again because. No, he did. He wanted that, his own guys in there. Yeah, right. he wanted his own guys. That's breaking promises to a lot of people, not just the position coaches, but to recruits who might have committed and signed based with on on Lincoln saying, "Hey, this is going to be the guy going forward." And I know that folks out there think that, "Hey, a coach is a coach." No, it's not. These are people for which have become family to you, and you trust them mm -hmm. in a way that you don't trust anybody else. You've given yep. them pledges, like, "Hey, I'm not going to take any more visits." Uh, I am not going to flirt with anybody else. I am committed. I, I'm staying here. And those things are taken seriously on both sides. The commit, the commitments aren't one way. They're not just for players. They're also for players to coaches. That's how they started because you get to yep. recruit with that known, not just as an advantage, but that you don't need to recruit another dude at that position or to fill whatever uh, scholarship distribution chart you need to fill based on that guy's word. So, for instance... If you said to one of these coaches, and I don't just mean OU, I mean anybody, that you're committed, you're not taking any more visits, and then you took a visit, they're going to remember that, and they're going to break their word to you because you break your word to them. I mean, what else do they have to go on? So all of these things are of a piece. So you can't just go in there and say, hey, I'm going to blow up the entire defensive staff, which includes a dude that recruited you and you really like, because that's just not how people work. Relationships are everything, not just in this business, but in every business, in every position in life. You and I have relationships with folks uh, that are very close to the program, for which we're like those are our friends, right? And we're not yep. we we, yep. we have to we have to balance all of that, and this is the hard hard part about basically reporting on the team, right? Yeah, because uh, you don't want you don't you don't want to see people that you like, especially. I mean, I'm on the beat a lot, and I get to talk to these guys and all that. You hate to see that because then you get to know kind of their backstory and their families and. Stuff like that, and that that just hurts. I mean, watching them lose, lose their job, and they're out there trying to find another job, and knowing that they're going to move away. So it's somebody that you probably talked to quite a bit during the season, and a little bit off during the off season, at whatever meetings or something, or you bump into them or what have you. Um, that that just sucks. I mean, it's a personal relationship that you've built, and you've 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 harvested and 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 made sure that. You know, it's there for you whenever you possibly need it, and then it's gone. You know, that's that just sucks. And it's 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 a deal where these people are people. They're not just coaches; they're people. And people have to realize that that it's not just part of the job. But when people say that, it makes me cringe. Well, and so I the second the second you lose your job, is it part of your job? 
because that's not what you signed up. You didn't sign up to lose your job. It's so, not part so, of the job. So I I I want to I want to jump in here because we all know me as the guy who was very much out in front of get rid of Mike Stoops, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yep. And and I I've, I've, I've been critical of the staff and I've been critical of of some calls made, but I also get text and phone calls from some of these people for which it's like, yo, man, really? I'm like, look, you you know the product on the field. You know what's going on in that locker room. You know what the kids are saying about this. You know, well, you you ain't got to air out our dirty laundry. I don't, that, that, that's not what I'm doing. You know, it's it's keeping it 100 on on the, the on the front with me, right? right. Because I'm not going to carry anybody's water who you know, has been doing a bad job. Because at the end of the day, you and I have to do our jobs, and yeah, they have to do their exactly. jobs, right? And if yeah. you and I are bad at reporting on the team or talking about the team. We're going to get called out for it by anybody else, yep. and rightfully so. And I, that's mm-hmm. how I view coaching, right? That's how I view the position. If you're good at your job, guess what? That's going to show, yeah. right? Yeah. It doesn't matter if we're friends or not on that front. Now, well, I'm not. When I say that, I'm not saying you know they didn't sign up to get. Obviously, if they're doing a bad job, that that's right. a different story. Right. But is I'm you, talking about. You in, still don't necessarily this, like to see a person lose their job. That's no. And this is the instance where when you got a new guy come in, a new defensive coordinator. And let's let's throw Tim Kish out there for an example. Um, he, I can tell you, and I think everybody would agree that his position isn't the position that was the issue this year. I mean that that is one hundred percent facts. I mean his position was probably the strongest position on the defense. And now I know that's not saying much. No, it but- is saying much because two years ago. Even last year, there was yeah, lots it, of talk they, about, they were, hey, take Kish bad. out with Stoops. And you're talking yep. about having to revamp the entire position because, yeah, Corey Nelson, who might have been one of the best linebacker athletes that OU's had in, in the last decade, saying, I don't feel like we were a part of the defense. I don't feel like yeah. we were anything to do with, with this. And I mean, that's, that's schematic on Stoops. Right, 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 right. But also, you saw what he's been able to do with a guy like Kenneth Murray Jr., who did not play the position in high school. Didn't play the position Jordan when he got Evans, there. Oh my God! Right, yeah. right, right. And then yes. Curtis Bolton, Buzzy, out of nowhere. You know, uh, I just I yep. get that that everybody expected Caleb Kelly to be good, myself included. Be one of these guys to talk about leaving early because he there's was, issues behind that though. That they wasn't. I guarantee it wasn't Kitch. Sure, kid, and I, I guess that what kid, I'm saying God here is God bless him. He's played hard now that he's in the right back in the right spot. I, I what I'm but, saying here is we would have all expected Caleb Kelly to be one of these folks at this point yes. in his career to be looking at a decision like Bobby yeah, Evans is yeah, looking at a decision. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. So, you're right. so you know, it goes both ways on that, but I think the job he's done, particularly with the inside linebacker group, and then you got a guy like Deshaun White who feels like he's going to be a pretty great uh, middle linebacker. You, you're still growing up Brian Asamoa. You're still growing up your outside backers, guys like Nick Benito, and we'll see what Grinch has to say about the scheme. But I don't really have the problem with Tim Kish that I did have. Right, because I would look at his linebackers and say, "Yo, man, what, what's going on here?" Because it's one thing for these dudes to to be running from, uh, and they're not running from tackles to to miss tackles, <laughs> right? To miss tackles, it's another thing for them to be out of position, right? And as much as yeah. people wanted to say that Kenneth Murray Jr. is out of position, he chased down a lot of tackles, you know. Yeah, uh, he did, and you don't get to one fifty five by accident. No, no, he he didn't. He he played really well. Now I would say he fits better than Jack Backer or the Will. Than he does the mic, but if the situation Oklahoma's in, uh, as far it, it, and I think Oklahoma just they had a bad string of injuries there for a bit, and that's just how it ended up playing out. And at that point, everybody started trusting Kenneth Murray, and the, the players started listening to him, and he became became the leader on that defense. So they keep saying Mike be the mic, and when they say Mike be the mic, that means be the voice of the defense and that's what Kenneth Murray became so that's kind of where he got stuck and how it plays out now like you said Grinch when he comes in I would not be 100% shocked not at all if you end up seeing if he does stick to and I think he will probably stick to the multiple look more or less because that's what Oklahoma was recruited to but it's also he'll what he's do comfortable it. with. It's often what he's comfortable yeah, with. Yeah, it is what he's comfortable with. So it'll be more of a four man front. I mean, it's exactly what Oklahoma's ran, but it'll be more physical, more But it also it's more... it's it's what they ran with a one gap scheme. Yeah, and, with and a it, one gap. Yes. So, yes, so exactly what I was just, going at. Yep. Just I, I gotta get this out. My issue with Mike was one, 
what I know about the players and, and how they were treated, and I didn't like the way the whole Ricky DeBerry story played out at all, which is a whole different mm. podcast. But I also hated yeah. this. I also hated the scheme. Like, look, number one, we talk about defensive tackle recruiting all the time because we know that the team with the best defensive tackles wins national championships. We also know that there are fewer defensive tackles than there are any other position. And those are guys that not only play one gap, but prefer to play one gap. And there are no two gap college football players. There aren't dudes that big that can occupy two blocks and want to do the control blocking. They don't want to do that. That's not what they do. So for you to say that you're gonna play a two gap scheme at Oklahoma of all places, <laughs> where you know nobody could really play defense outside of TCU, that's hubris. And then you played the bail technique on the back end with a bunch of kids to play bump and run in high school. I was pulling my hair out because I'm I'm calling the defense and I'm going, that's where he's gonna get that dude's gonna get torched and it's not his fault. Buki's about to get yeah. torched and it's not his fault. You know, uh, uh, Parnell Motley is about to be hung out to dry in this quarter scheme and it's not his fault. I just you know I looked at Jordan Thomas. And you broke the NFL Combine cone drill record, which means cover two, corner, bump and run, corner. And yet you had to do play in cover three and cover four, and you wonder why he's getting beat because he doesn't have the straight line speed. I just, I would, I'd had it up to here with this, as you could very well see. <laughs> I, and I, and I'm, I looked at Grinch, and I said, oh, God, a 3-4, multiple, I hate this. But then it was, hey, we play one gap. Hey, we play man coverage. Hey, we play bump and run. Oh, oh, okay, I'm fine. Oh, your one gap yep. also has that Jack linebacker that's basically a defensive end that you call a rush in? I can do that. Cool. Thank you. No, yeah, that is that you know what? I don't care what anybody says. That three four, that is why it's my favorite, because if it's a one gap scheme, if it's a one gap scheme. Because I love the Von Miller types. I love the Obo and Karanquo types. I love the striker types where they just pin their ears back and they just get after that quarterback. Because you could tell Oklahoma not having that guy this year was an issue like a major issue for that team they'd have been so much better with a guy like that i mean that that's stating the obvious i know but i mean any defense is going to be great with they have oboe coming off the edge but they needed that this year more than any other year that they've ever needed they could have probably been a lot better they could have been okay last year with that or, or at least similar as far as the defense this year was the one year that they needed it because you saw the jalen redmond's go down with with you know the blood clot you saw the addison gums where he pulled his where he tore his acl and then just transferred which was still to this day i mean it, people knew the story behind that which i'll never say is just the weirdest deal ever outside of bryce youngquist is the weirdest deal ever i mean i'm working on I'm, i've been working on a bryce youngquist <clears throat> project for like two years i'm going to find out what happened uh I'll talk to you off the air. No, 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 no. I, I think I know what you know, but yes, we're going to talk off the air. No, 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 no. I'll talk to you off the air. I've been – all right. I can't wait to hear this because I, I've i literally been <laughs> okay, working on this. Okay, now people are going to ask us, what – oh, let, let them ask. Let them ask. Let them ask. Never going to tell, guys. Right? Never let, tell, let them so. ask. Anyway, yeah, you were, you were talking about uh, – like we – I, the three four defense works at places like uh, Alabama because they play man and because they have bigger, stronger, faster dudes playing defense, and they play one gap. Like that's if you watch Quentin Williams, what was his job? His job was to get over the top of Creed Humphrey. Like he lined up in the nose. We get that, but his job was to go between the the, the guard and the center, and he was pissing Drew Samia off. He was oh making him mad because he was sunning him up front. Now, that's not a two-gap Oklahoma dude. did okay against him. I will say this. The line, they held their own against that guy. But he was such – They it was so – he was such a beast. Say it with they had to put two, disruptive two and three guys on him. Force. And two that's, and three guys. That's the thing, right? That's what you're asking for. That's what Mike thought was going to happen and what he kind of got out of Jordan Phillips, right? If you have Jordan yep. Phillips going, no, I'm so good, you're going to double-team me every play, then, yeah, this kind of sort of can work. But you need – Four dudes on the line to try to give that guy an opportunity to earn that double team. You can't exactly yeah. you can't have you can't just line him up with two other dudes and say, "All right, go occupy the middle." No, it doesn't work that way. That's not football. No, you can't guarantee a Tapper or a Jordan Phillips is going to walk through that door, and that is exactly what I felt what so Oklahoma bad for Jordan Wade. You know, because because yeah. he was like like he's a good three technique. 
but he wasn't a three yep. technique. He was a zero here. And you look at it, Devontae Lampkin, it's like he's big enough. He should be a, a, a nose. That ain't the way the dude was coached to play ball, though. You know, no. all of these dudes out of high school, nobody in high school runs a two-gap scheme. Nobody. Right? You don't teach your kids to hold blocks. You teach your kids to split between yeah, the, the line. Not, that, it, that takes so much more... You have to be so smart because when you when you when you run a two back two gap scheme, you have to be able to anticipate what's about to happen before the before the ball snapped. And in high school, you're not smart enough. In college, you're barely smart enough, and you're only barely smart enough the last two years of your high your college career. So, what makes you think walking into a college atmosphere that these guys? Oh yeah, I'm going to be a two gap scheme. That's not going to work. It is not going to work. In the NFL, yeah, that's great. They've seen so much football, they can do that. But you cannot do it at the amateur level. It's not happening. Well, and that's kind of that's kind of where I'm going with it is and that's why I've always kind of been a proponent of man defense and I know that we got we got the we got the the macho brigade on on our, on our side with this, but I'm not really I'm not really speaking to the Roy D Mercers of the world when I say this. I run man not because <laughs> I want to get more physical. I run man because it's simple to teach, and I want my kids to be fundamentally sound and not have to make any more adjustments. That The thing that sold me about Alex Grinch has nothing to do with his scheme, has nothing to do with the takeaway uh, philosophy, which I love, has nothing to do with his background. It has everything to do with this. He gives a single word as the call, and every one of his kids knows what their job is based on a word. He yells that razor. That is awesome. They, he yells razor, and they say, cool, we got it. He he yells stifle. He they say cool. We got it. Like that was the thing where it's like, oh my god, you're doing all the thinking and letting the kids be simple and stick to their fundamentals. That's your job as a coach. You're the person who's supposed to keep the complicated play scheme in your head, and the kids are the ones going, no. If I play my technique, I'm fine. That that is awesome. I did not know that about him. That's something I very I just learned, and that is awesome. That is so smart. If you can keep that from being picked up by other teams. That is so smart and so easy instead of having to do all these check with me's and all these keys. I mean, they're always going to have keys, but and, and, and the reads, it's just, yeah, it, it simplifies them though. Right. And I, I got this. Oh man, it's simplify them. I got this shirt, you know, cause I, I like shirts and, and I got shirts on the Teespring, but it's, it's make me your defensive coordinator, which is basically for anybody that, you know, wants to call defense or thinks they would do better job than whoever's calling. It's tongue in cheek. But the point is, <laughs> the, the point here is, I've always believed you recruit elite players because you they have things that you can't teach like speed, like size, all those things. But you also have to let them use those things by not handicapping them with too much to think about. Like, I was thinking about this uh, over the last year or so, but it was – Buki was it was a corner in high school. He was a corner. He's recruited as a corner. And then it was like, no, nah, he's going to play safety. Okay, what kind of – oh, he's going to play nickel. Okay, how often has this dude played nickel in high school? Literally none at all. And then you put him in a scheme where he doesn't absolutely have leverage. He doesn't always know his leverages. And what he does best he can't do, which is get up in your chili because he is a short dude. He has to be more physical with you, and he has to be able to run with you to, to make a play on the ball. Instead, you got him bailing out, and he's already backpedaling when the other dude is at full speed, and you're just taking him out of what he does well. You're not letting his abilities... Take over, which is the thing that you have to have if you're defense because you had a disadvantage. You know, I've always thought that you need to have bigger, faster, stronger guys on your defense than on your offense because they have to be able to react. They have to get aligned, right? And then they have to react. If you're not aligned, right. you're not going to be able to react. If you are aligned and you can't react fast enough, I can't teach you that, right? I can't teach you to be no. faster. So that, that was, I mean, all of this, I, I feel like I'm sometimes making it too simple, but it's also the way that I see it. No, I, I'm with you. I, 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 I cannot tell you how much I have looked forward to a defensive scheme where I didn't have to look at a player shrugged over to the sidelines and just go, w w what am I supposed to do here? That we've seen in Oklahoma for like the past decade. I mean, even under Ruffin McNeil, we were seeing that because it was still, you know, the same scheme, same structure. Same everything, where sometimes the players, they just don't know. And and I know that they threw out a lot of stuff. And I think that also hurt Oklahoma. When you throw out a bunch of stuff as far as the, the calls and the schemes because somebody doesn't understand that, I think that's a 
that's kind of an indoctrination on you as a coach where, okay, so they don't understand it. You're just going to throw it out. And this is on Wednesday before the game, right? You have two more days to practice. And instead of teaching them, you know, kind of simplifying it and teaching them, you know, you can throw out some, but not all. That's where you need to teach them where they're, they're not understanding. You know what I mean? Like teach them. And they didn't do that. And you saw that on the field every Saturday for Oklahoma. They don't know where they're supposed to be. They're filling in gaps wrong. They're reading their keys wrong. It's just like, what the hell so, is going on? Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, it was still there with Ruffin even. With yeah, the, that's what I mean. Yeah, like, with the goal line stand that wasn't. With Alabama, we're, we're, we're looking at this and we're going, why is nobody covering up this tight end and this, and this left tackle or this right tackle? And you got Caleb Kelly pointing at it. Instead of, you know, lining up over the top of it. And, of course, they ran the ball in. But the fact of the matter is you don't know what your assignments are all the time. <laughs> you know, it's just it, – it, it, it was it's just so infuriating to everybody who's watching it. And yeah. the coaches aren't necessarily doing themselves a service of explaining why and how they coach defense. And this gets me back to the Mike Stoops thing of – you don't get to say anymore in this day and age, and this is this is probably me talking more as a millennial, and I and I fight with Gen Xers and Boomers about this all the time, but you don't you don't live in a world anymore where you don't have to explain yourself. Kids want to know why, and they know what they want to know what for, and fans want to know mm -hmm. why, and they want to know what for. So you getting up to the podium? We're just stupid fans, right? And and, and, you, and you getting up to? I the was podium. just quoting my. I was just quoting that one. The, you know what quote I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, and, I, and I get it, right? Because, like, there's yeah. CEOs make the same thing. But you don't get to be flippant with the fan base that lives and breathes this. You don't get to be flippant with your kids who you're asking to literally sacrifice their bodies to implement your plan. You have to be able yeah. to explain it to everybody. Like, Jim Moore Jr. had this with Josh Rosen at UCLA. It's like millennials. They just want everything explained to them. Yeah, we do. And you know what? A lot of this is a product of being raised in the age of not just the internet – but a financial crisis. We don't trust you anymore. We don't <laughs> trust true. a word that you say. You told us everything was going to be fine. And now we're supposed to clean up the mess that you left us without – and we're supposed to just take your word for it? No, that's not going to fly. And I think all of that comes back down to players are smarter than they used to be. They're certainly more athletic than they used to be, and they want to know why they're doing something. And yeah. I think fans are the same way, which is one of the reasons why I think Lincoln Riley – is perfect for the job that he has because he has just the right tone of pissed about a question or not. Yeah, and he's patient. He's right. so patient. He will uh, consider it a question, right? He'll consider yeah, it. You can see the wheels turning when you're talking to him. And he'll say things like, like I get I why you got to ask this? it, right? I, I get why you got to ask that question. And then he'll answer it. You know, he's just like, <clears> we don't think about it, so forth, so on. And he'll he'll give you he'll give you a best effort. Which I, yeah. which I enjoy because there are things that he's also said, you know, I'm just not going to talk about that aspect of it, but I can say this. You know, and I get that. And I think fans get that. I think they understand that there are things that they just can't be privy to. Yeah, yeah. no. I, I, yeah, you, you've, you've nailed it. Like, they've got to um, – They he has always and will forever, hopefully, you know. I, but, I mean, I remember Stoops back when he was – in his younger days, he was really, really good with the media as well. But – um, it's just he understands it, and I think he looks at it when you're talking to him. You it feels like even even okay. So during the Big Twelve uh, media day, I got to bump into him in the hallway because working with CBS, we get to go into all those rooms, you know, and 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 be, you know, with just us, you know, and it's just us and the, and the coach, and we get to watch them do all the promos and and get to talk to him. Well. He sit there and he'll talk to you. I mean, especially if he knows you and you're on the beat, but he'll he'll talk to you and listen and and act like it's just you and him are the only ones in the room and you're the most important thing. And I think that's a lost art. I think with the older generation of, of coaches, where they they they're they're too busy, you know. But with the younger I, guys, I, and I think that's where where we're getting at and where Riley is getting at. He's getting all these younger guys because he feels like, hey, I need younger guys to reach these this new generation because they may not be from or directly from that same generation, but they're so damn close that they're going to understand a little bit more than everybody else. Well, and I guess uh, what I'm getting at with that is, is just another layer of 
Bob was like that when he was younger. Mike Gundy was like that when he was younger. Yeah. And at, the, at a certain level of success, and I think really at a certain level of money, they just don't care anymore. They don't want to be patient. I can't see Riley being that way, actually. No, well, I guess, I guess we're going to have to wait and see because people change in 18 years. You know, like Bob yeah. used to run. Bob was hungry. And it's not just that he was hungry. He's been hungry. He was hungry toward the end. Uh, but his level of patience for what he wanted to put up with and what he wanted to continue to explain year after year was running thin. And I think you saw that with things like Twitter. He was there. Or John Hoover. Well, I love I mean, John Hoover. John Hoover was my dog. Yeah, I was about to say. Uh, I we, still, we both I love still, him. Yeah, we both do. Like that's our that's our dude right there. But I think those yeah, two got but, after but, it so much. That was so fun though, watching those two go after it. And that's kind of what I'm getting at with Riley is the moment that you see him just get perturbed with a beat writer. Not 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 somebody at you know the the Orange Bowl going. You gonna go to the NFL? No, like you were talking about the folks he has relationships with that see him on a regular basis that follow him to caravans that come to every press conference that are there for post game that are, when he's when you see him getting testy with folks like you like Carrie like uh like Hoove like Bailey like Kersey folks who who listen to this podcast you're going to know their names then you'll yeah. see that Lincoln Riley might be getting to a point where he needs to take a break because I saw it with Mike Gundy here going off the rails meaning the moment Mike Gundy gets on a podium and starts talking noise about millennials who are the people he's supposed to be recruiting to Oklahoma State, <laughs> you have a problem. Because if I'm incensed and, I don't, and I'm not being recruited by Oklahoma State and I don't care if Oklahoma State wins or loses, that's a problem for you. Because folks that want to be invested no longer are. They feel like you've just thrown them aside. And in this age, you could say, hey, we're going to do this without you. You don't need you. Yeah, you could say that. But we're going to go to Alabama and we're going to put together something that, that's going to dwarf what you make. Because I don't know about you, but the way I'm built is to get poked in the chest is for me to want to fight you. To, yeah. and, I, and by fight you, I mean I'm going to do this better than you and I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. You know, and, and I think for me, for folks that know that I wrote this book, I got to be really good with a pistol. And I got really good with a pistol in part because I was embarrassed about how bad I was at it. And folks were poking me in the chest going... You know, you're not very good, and you probably won't be because, well, what's a black dude from the city going to know about pistols? And I think I, I, that's that's yeah. this generation. This generation is, oh, really? Watch me. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on that. Like, as, as far as me getting into this industry, I was maligned and scoffed and poked and prodded. You know, I mean, you saw it from afar, I guess. Um, and was was around all that, and I, I just kind of said, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to outwork everybody, hopefully, and one day I may get to where I want to be. And I haven't reached that goal yet, but, I mean, I'm still trying, and I'm still working hard because I want to prove everybody wrong that I can make it. And that that's kind of where I stand, and that's kind of our generation. Like, well, this generation's out to prove everybody wrong, and I know it rubs older people wrong, but... You know, that that is what it is. And, and I think that's a good place to, to leave this one where we, uh, we kind of <laughs> probably should probably cut all that. Uh, out, well, actually. I, 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 <laughs> no, I think that's I think this is a part of us that that folks appreciate. And I think yeah. this the, the folks that that listen to the podcast like us and they like knowing this about us and our work ethic um, and and what drives us, because I know that that's a part of listening to other people who do this for a living that I really jones off of is. Hey, uh, what's your backstory? Who are you? What makes you tick? Yeah. You know, so I, I don't know. I, I think this should stay. Okay. All right. Fair. All right. Well, that's going to do it for me and Brandon Drum on Young and Drum, where we're talking about Alex Grinch and apparently millennials who are just dunking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brandon, parting shot. Man, I, I love the hire. Uh, I think it's going to be a great hire. I think the people that think that it's just going to be a snap of the fingers and everything's going to be fixed uh, are living in, a dream, living in a dream world. But I can't say that it won't happen because he's done it done it before and he did it in Pullman, Washington. Um, I just think you need to temper your expectations and understand that you're going to see improvement. You will see improvement next year, and you probably will see a different you know, variation of the defensive staff than you saw or have seen in the past three or four years. So um, that's something to look forward to if you are an Oklahoma fan. And this this is gonna be this is gonna be a, a fun off season because we still have the QB transfer stuff that's gonna go on, especially after after Monday. It's gonna get intriguing. 
once if Hertz puts his name in there, he okay. I can say that he has applied for grad school at Alabama, but that I don't think that says anything because he kind of has to because he has to, you know, make sure he has I guess a backup I, plan. I can speak to that, meaning that you can enroll and you can withdraw in six inside of six weeks, but you could also finish out the semester and transfer over the summer with everybody knowing what yeah. your intentions are. So that's that's not as a big a deal as people want to make it out to be. No, so it won't mean a whole lot of anything. So I think this is going to play out. It could draw out, like like RJ just said, it could draw out all the way into spring and into summer before we know anything with him. But I don't expect that to happen. I expect uh, things to really start to pop after, you know, um, after the national title game because I think he's going to either want to join Loxley in Maryland or he's going to want to be in Oklahoma. I don't think Alabama is the spot for him. That's just my opinion. Uh, my parting shot is uh, just a quick shout-out to Brian Bishop, who hired a couple 30-year-olds with their hair on fire, who, who basically <laughs> Very did, well said. Did, did, did this their own way to get to a point to where we got his attention and we got the attention of, of folks at 24-7 and CBS, and we are so very grateful to be doing this job and doing it the way that we know how to do it, we have been empowered to, to work to our strengths. We have been p- empowered to do the job the best way we know how and to with uh, with all the work ethic and the ethical standards for which that we hold up and we hold dear. So uh, this podcast is a product of that. And, and no matter what goes on with the defense, no matter what goes on with OU, no matter what goes on from here, we're both sincerely grateful to everybody who listens and everybody who's yes. given us a shot along the way because we Absolutely. would not be here otherwise. Yep. Very well said. Very well said. And I concur 100%. 1,000%. 1 million percent, actually. All right, that's going to do it for us. Uh, deuces, fam. Oh.